What's up, Joe? What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Sports 360. We are back. Rob Duran is with me from Rob Duran Sports, and it's been a long time. But, brother, we are back. What's up, man? What's going on? Yes, we are back and better than ever. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Um, I don't know when the last time we spoke we were talking about maybe it was when you gave us your mlb uh 2022 predictions but um whatever it was it's been a long time um for those who don't know it's all on me because i was dealing with mlb salary arbitration um for the past several months we had a number of cases uh, a few of them that went to hearing, um, but just the crush of the schedule just kept us away. But it's over now, brother, and we are back. And I'm glad. I'm glad. I mean, we missed a lot of things that we could have talked about, but obviously we're just going to pick up and, and go on from here. And, um, you know, I don't think there's any better place to start than with baseball and with your Yankees, because I know you've been riding high as the Yankees have shown themselves to be the best team in baseball so far. Yeah, man. And let me tell you, if we go back to my predictions, I did not have them winning the division. Um, I had them going into the wild card. I had Toronto taking the AL East. And somebody heard me and said, you know what? Let's show this guy what's up. And the Yankees have just been playing out of their minds this entire season, right from the jump. And let me tell you, like you said, I'm riding high and I'm loving it. And and what has it been? I'm sure it's been a number of factors, but what has it been that has, you know, taken the Yankees from, you know, from being a playoff team for sure coming into the season, but being so much more than that through the first three months of the season, what, what has been, what has been the explanation you know, what are the factors that has given them, you know, sort of this, you know, this dominating presence uh, so far in 2022? I think really it's a combination of three things, and it's really three things you want to see your teams do in October come playoff time. It's great pitching, great defense, and then being healthy. And knock on wood, throw salt over my back or whatever, <laughs> whatever bad luck stuff to get all that out of there. But the Yankees have had the fortunate uh, luck to be healthy this season, which is not something that we've been able to say in the past few seasons, you know, especially to key players. Um, so they've had, you know, like John Carlos was out for a couple weeks, but it's been minor stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, these guys have been healthy. Um, they're playing some really good defense and, timely hitting they're hitting strikes hard which is something that's also been different their 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 approach at the plate and credit to the new hitting coach i believe his name is dylan lawson credit to him because his philosophy was we're going to hit strikes hard we're not going to swing at bad pitches we're not going to hit bad pitches we're going to swing at strikes hard and it's something that the yankees have been doing and it's a testament you know to how well they played and then the pitching is number one and two you know, across baseball, depending on, you know, what stats you're looking at. Um, They're number two in ERA, but overall, one of the best pitching staffs in baseball, um, led by Garrett Cole, who everyone was, you know, flipping about when he was struggling at the beginning of the season. Um, But it was just a matter of time before he he got hot. We have to remember spring training was weird with the lockout and stuff like that. So I kind of blame that. But the pitching overall has just been phenomenal you know, surprise starts by Cortez and Severino, who's now healthy and continues to be, you know, once upon a time, he was the eighth of this staff. And now he's number two or even number three with Cortez at number two. And they, they've just been phenomenal, Jeff. And it's amazing to see that this is probably the best Yankee team I've seen since 2009 when they won the championship. And, and I'm happy about it, man. And one one person you didn't mention so far but who obviously has been a key part of their success has been Aaron judge. What's your take on the seasons he has had so far? 
To be honest, it does not surprise me. Aaron Judge is a big-time player. He does not shy away from the bright lights. You know, he's done it in the postseason where he's come up with clutch hits, clutch home runs, and it's just an extension of that. You know, he's playing phenomenal center field, which obviously he came into the season, he was going to be the right fielder, you know, due to, you know, Aaron Hicks struggling, uh, Joey Gallo struggling, you know, John Carlos Stan coming, coming in and out of, you know, DH and right field. Aaron Judge has been put out there in center field, and he accepted the responsibility, he accepted the role, and he's being the, the team leader. He's being the leader. He put the team on his back and said, let's go. And this team is going to go as far as Aaron Judge takes them. And let me tell you, this guy is going for gold. Yeah, I mean, he's been phenomenal. He, I mean, he's just been phenomenal from from the opening bell. Um, but, you know, over this past weekend, Houston played them really tough at Yankee Stadium. And it was a four-game set, uh, ended up a 2-2. Um, you know, with the Yankees getting two walk-off wins, you, you know, both courtesy of Aaron Judge, <laughs> coincidentally, <laughs> right, uh, in the first game and also in the last game um, of the series. Um, but Houston kind of kept the Yankees' bats quiet, even, you know, including a, you know, a combined no-hitter in the third game of the series. And with no hitting the Yankees in the last game of the series up until what, like the fifth or sixth inning. And then the Yankees mounted a comeback. But, um, you know, again, you know, the Yankees two victories were walk off. So they had to come from behind in both games. Um, You know, the first one, they scored four runs in the ninth inning. Right. Um, So um, what do you think about Houston? Did even though, you know, the series was split two two. Did Houston send the Yankees a message? I think there was some humble pie served to New York. And I think a lot of Yankee fans accept that as well, at least just looking at social media. Um, It's kind of like, all right, Houston is still the team to beat. And yeah, the Yankees are the best team in baseball this year. But Houston has been to the ALCS, I believe, five years in a row. And, you know, they, they beat us. They beat the Yankees a couple years to get there and to get to the World Series. So Houston is the team to beat. They are the team that I I believe if everything holds still, they will be there in the ALCS waiting for the Yankees, and the Yankees will have to get through them if they want to win a championship. Listen, Houston, and they have great pitching. And Justin Verlander coming back off Tommy John, he's another guy. I didn't think he would be as good as he's pitching, considering the injury and the recovery and all that stuff. But this guy has not missed a beat, and it's insane at his age, to come back from that kind of injury, to be up there in the Cy Young conversation and just pitching lights out, it's it's incredible. Yeah, and I would would have to agree with you, man. I think if you look at the teams right now uh, in the American League, um, you know, Minnesota, you know, you can't take seriously, you know, they're Minnesota and especially, yeah. <laughs> you know, if the, if Minnesota has to play the Yankees, you think all kinds of ghosts goose, and goblins are going to be making noises <laughs> in the Minnesota clubhouse. I think they're just, <laughs> they're just haunted by the Yankees right now. Um, and then I think, you know, in the East, Boston has turned it around and they're playing better. Toronto, you know, um, you know, they're not, playing like they were um, maybe expected to play. Um, And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think, you know, they lost Robbie Ray, they lost Simeon. And then, you know, can Vladdy repeat what, you know, an otherworldly year that he had last year? You know what I mean? I think that's asking a lot. Um, But, you know, it's still early, and I think they can still swing the, the bats. But, you know, I think, you know, when you look around, Who else? Because there's no one out West. Seattle has been a disappointment. Um, So you think Houston has that sewn up. Um, The Central doesn't really seem to be really going to produce anyone that's going to give anyone a challenge. So, yeah, more than likely, it's going to be Yankees-Houston. Now, anything can happen over the next three months. But as you look at it right now, it looks like it's going to be Yankees-Houston. And, you know, um, you know, that's why I look at this series uh, that, 
Houston just said to the Yankees in a way, hey, don't forget about us. That's what it seemed yeah. like. You know what I mean? That they let them know, don't forget about us. We're here. And, you know, you might be running through Tampa and, and Toronto and cleaning their clock, but, you know, we're we're different. And so it seemed like there was a little bit of a message sent, but I don't see I don't see anyone else standing in the way in the American League. I just don't. No, you know, the only teams that I would be worried about, honestly, would come from the AL East. And I don't think that they have the firepower to attack the Yankees pitching. And I don't think that they have the pitching to stop the Yankees hitting. So, uh, you know, the, the Yankees are the most balanced team, I think, in the AL East, maybe in the American League in general, Houston being the only other team that can step up to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I mentioned Seattle. What's happened to them? I think for many, Seattle was viewed as that next team that they were going to make that next step. They just missed out on the playoffs last year. They made some, you know, big time, you know, uh, free agent acquisitions. Uh, they brought up, you know, J rod and you know what I'm saying? And people just thought this team is ready. They're ready to break that long playoff drought that they've, that they've had. Um, but here they are and they're scuffling, you know, they're a few games under 500, you know, they're even behind Anaheim right now yeah. in, in the West. What, what's happened to, to Seattle? They got me, man, because I thought, like you said, I was one of those people saying, this is the team, you know, they're a young team. They have Julio Rodriguez, like you mentioned, coming up. He's going to light it up. They got Robbie Ray, who just has completely underperformed. They just, I don't know, man. They're, they're a team that I expected to be there with Houston, maybe even take the division. I, I think I had them winning the division, if I'm not mistaken. But they just have underperformed all around. Um, you know, Suarez got in there. He got he was part of the Winker trade. Both of those guys haven't, you know, Suarez has 13 home runs, but they haven't really performed like they were performing with Cincinnati, especially Winker, um, even though he was trying to fight a whole team yesterday. <laughs> but that's besides the point. <laughs> but yeah, they've they've just underperformed all around, especially with the pitching, man. And it's just it's disappointing to see because this is a team that I believe thought or I thought had a lot of potential to really take that next step, especially the way they ended the season last year. Yeah. And and, and it seemed like Seattle to me is the team that when you don't expect anything from them, they play well. And then, you know, it's been a couple of times where they just missed out on the playoffs. And then, you know, the expectations are heightened for the next season and now they fall flat. So I just don't know what has happened with them, but they, they, they've certainly have been one of the disappointments so far. Um, and I give I, you another, credit, Jeff, hmm? because you said to me when I made my pick, Seattle has to watch out because now everyone's watching. Mm -hmm. And I think like you just said, everyone's watching and, and they've underperformed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's something, you know, like there are times where you can kind of sneak up on, on a, on a league. Right. And it can happen in football. It can happen in, in basketball and other leagues too, where you can sneak up on them and, you know, by the time people realize you're good, you're halfway to three quarters into the season and you're, you know, yeah. now you're confident, you, you really think you can win and teams still are trying to catch up to you now. You know what I mean? Oh, wow, they're better than we thought, right? And you can ride that for a while. But once the season is over, teams go, okay. You know what I mean? They're going to scout you harder from the beginning. Yeah. And it just becomes different. And then also, too, it's the, it's the pressure of now you're expected to win in your city. It's not a feel-good story. It's not a Cinderella story. You're expected to win now. And, you know, some, some guys wilt under the expectation. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that's what's happened in Seattle, but I'm not saying it hasn't either. You know what I mean? Um, but for whatever reason, they haven't performed well. And another team, Rob, that for me that's kind of been a head scratcher is the Chicago White Sox. 
Um, I don't know why they're scuffling the way they are. And right now, Chicago is in third place, I believe, uh, in the American League Central behind Minnesota, who's leading the division, and the Guardians, who have been a surprise so far. Yeah, and I think it maybe goes back to pitching as well. Lance Lynn, you know, he was hurt to start the season, hasn't done well. Uh, Giolito hasn't done well. I think the only one that's done decent this season has been Dylan Sees, um, who's like a strikeout machine. Um, he's the only one I think that can, that stands out in that rotation. And their bullpen hasn't really been that good either. Um, and they just made some head-scratching decisions throughout the game. And I think that starts with Tony La Russa at coaching. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this is his last season. I don't know if he'll finish the season, but I would not be surprised if they make a move at, at manager after this season. It's just, this is a roster that, you know, in my eyes, I thought one and two with New York or with Houston, you know, they should be up in that conversation, you know, as the dominant teams of their division. And they just, they just haven't clicked. They haven't put it together and they're losing winnable games games that they would have won last season or even the year before. And, you know, are they going to get it together? Are they going to click? You would think so because the talent is there. But listen, that extra wild card spot may help them. Maybe not because the AL East is pretty strong, but they need to get things together in a hurry if they want to salvage the season. Yeah, I agree with that. And you mentioned Tony La Russa. Um, and look, I'm I'm on record as, you know, being skeptical of the hiring last year. Um, and then he went out and proved me wrong, and I gave him credit for it. Um, uh, but at the same time, I think Tony La Russa is one of those guys who, obviously, he's been around for a long time, Hall of Famer, all the rest of that, you know, World Series champion. But he does some crazy things, even like sometimes throwing his own players under the bus. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the guy admires a home run or swings at a 3-0 pitch and hits a home run in a blowout. He criticizes his own guys, which he did this year. But, you know, the biggest head scratcher to me and the thing that said to me, OK, Tony, it's time for you to go home, is in the series against the Dodgers when yeah. he he ordered an intentional walk to Trey Turner on an 0-2 pick when the count was 0-2. Yeah. And then Max Muncy, the next batter, took the pitcher deep for like a 3-1 home run. And, and I'm just thinking to myself, he, and, and LaRusso was like, anybody who criticizes that doesn't understand baseball. I'm like, man, dude, please. That was a dumb move. Yeah. He blamed it on something that Trey Turner is, a really good hitter on 0 and 2 counts, something like yeah. that. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. come on, man. <laughs> so, so during the game, you got him on 0 and 2, you're going to walk him every time. <laughs> come on. <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> you know, so yeah, but they, they've been, they've been really, you know, scuffling along. And um, like you said, I mean, I still think they have time to turn it around because I don't think they're too far out right now to even capture that division. You know, I'm, I'm still not sold on Minnesota, and I think the Guardians are just playing over their heads right now. But again, who knows? The Guardians could be one of those teams that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, but, you know, you look up and it's halfway through the season, and, you know, now we're beyond the All Star break and they're still playing well. And then you got to give them, you know, you got to give them credit and maybe take them a bit more seriously. But they have to do it in order to, to you know, impress me I, I think right now yeah they're playing well but i don't expect them to continue playing well but you know there is one team rob that i hope continues playing well and that is my new york metropolitans because Ooh. they're in first place in the national league east and you know there was a time man where it was clear that the mets and yankees were the best two teams in baseball I think the Mets have fallen off a little bit, you know, in recent weeks. You know, they have, you know, they've been playing a tough schedule. Yeah. You know what I mean? They went out west. They played the Dodgers. They played San Diego. They played Anaheim, but it was out west, and you know, it was a long, you know, long um, uh, series um, or road trip. Um, then they came home. They played Milwaukee. Um, you know, and you know they. Uh, you know they they had to play Houston and Houston beat them. You know in the in the, in the quick two game set, 
But overall, the Mets have been playing well. Um, what are your thoughts on on the other New York team um, and, and how they've been playing so far? I think the Mets, listen, I, I had high expectations for them coming into the season. Obviously, health was the biggest concern for them. I didn't, I didn't question their talent. I didn't question anything else. It was health. And, you know, unfortunately, Scherzer has been in and out here and there. Uh, the Grom still hasn't come back. But once those guys get back into the swing of things, especially the Grom, um, that's a dangerous team, man. I think they'll continue to hold, hold still at first place. Atlanta, you know, they have their hot stretches. They can get hot at any moment. They're just one of those teams. But the Mets, listen, they've shown they can play with everybody. And like you said, at one point, they were one of the best teams in baseball. I think they have enough pitching to get through the season. I think, you know, the trade deadline coming up, maybe add a piece or two to that bullpen to really fortify that that pen and really get game, you know, once games get in there late, to have that person to come in, whether it's the sixth, the seventh, whatever the case may be to lead to Edwin Diaz in the eighth or the ninth. I like your chances, man. I think the Mets are for real. I think they're going to continue to play well. And if I were you, Jeff, I wouldn't stress it too much. Listen, both New York teams, New York baseball is booming this year. This is our year, man. We can celebrate together this year. Well, look, I I hear you, but there's a reason why Um, When you talk about a Mets fan, right, it's always preceded by two words or maybe one word, long-suffering Mets fan, (laughs) okay? Um, Because that's that's what it is, man. (laughs) You know, (laughs) we know if you're a Mets fan, you know, you've been through some traumatic experiences. And so, you know, you just learn not to get too high. But I do like what the Mets have been doing. I, I do like... Sort of like what the Yankees did. The Yankees roster composition is good. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They they don't just have guys who swing for the fences. You know what I mean? They have some guys who can make contact and, and so forth. They still have power. You know, it's no question about that. But they also, the Yankees have been interesting too, where they've just been plugging in guys who come in and get new life, whether it's Matt Carpenter or Marwin Gonzalez or whatever. You know what I mean? I Which has been kind of interesting to watch. But I like the Mets, you know, because they have a guy like Mark Canna who's no, you know, no one's going to go all crazy over Mark Canna, right? But he's going to be a guy who gives you professional at-bats. Same thing with Eduardo Escobar, you know what I mean? And then you got Nimmo, who's a guy who gets on base a lot, you know, and a high OPS guy because of his on-base percentage. And then Lindor's been playing better. You got the polar bear, you know, there. Marte gives you that speed and that little blend of power, too. You know what I mean? They just have a nice mix. You know what I mean? Um, And their pitching has been really surprising because, as you said, with Scherzer and DeGrom down, they still have been pitching well. Taiwan Walker's been great, but he was great the first half last year, too. You know what I mean? He was an all-star, and then he didn't pitch that well in the second half, but He's been really great this year, um, and Peterson's pitched well. McGill, when he was in there, has pitched well. You know, Chris Bassett's been interesting because, you know, I, that was actually one of the cases I had in arbitration. He ended up settling his case, and he was pitching well, and then he settled his case, and he hasn't been the same. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? He really hasn't been the same. He had a couple of outings where he's gotten rocked. And then he's also yeah. had a couple of outings with a bullpen blew it for him as well. But, um, you know, he did get the win in his last outing and he's six and five right now. But, um, you know, they need him to be Chris Bassett, though. You know what I'm saying? Especially when Scherzer went down. It seemed like at first he really, you know, picked up the mantle. But they need him to get back to form because if he gets back to form, Scherzer seems that like he's really close to coming back. I don't know when DeGrom is going to come back. Um, you know, their pitching could really be strong. And I agree with you. If they get something in the bullpen, that could make them, you know, a, a real threat in, in the National League. Yeah, Chris Bassett as a number three, if he pitches like Chris Bassett, is that's something. Yeah. That is that is something. Yeah. And then I think out west, I still think the Dodgers are the best team out there. I know San Diego's been playing well. Um, San Francisco, I think, has come back down to earth. 
Um, I think San Diego has played well, but I just think the Dodgers are just too deep, too strong. And over the course of a 162, they're going to grind that division to dust, I think. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of time. I think they're, they're you know, like you said, San Diego has played well. <clears throat> Excuse me. They got hot for a little bit. But at the end of the day, the Dodgers are just, they're in another level. And I think once the summer really gets going, they're, they're going to start pulling away little by little. I agree. Uh, that, yeah. That's that's their division. Yeah, yeah, it is. No doubt about it. Um, before we leave baseball, you mentioned the brawl that took place yesterday as we're speaking. It took place on Sunday um, between Seattle and and Anaheim. Um, first of all, that that was that was that wasn't a typical baseball fight you know most of the time they say, oh there was a brawl in baseball and it's like a lot of milling around right yeah maybe a little bit of pushing you know whatever yesterday nah nah man they threw down <laughs> <laughs> that was a fight yesterday um what was your take on that because the thing that struck me and you mentioned it how winker went over there and took on like the whole thing but I kept Rob. How did he get over there by himself? How did he? Because <laughs> he got hit and he was walking toward first, and Anaheim's dugout is on the third base side. How did he get over there? And he's standing there surrounded and like you know all these red jerseys. Where was his teammates at? I don't know, man. The moment your player takes a step the wrong way, you have to come out, whether something happens or not. That has, you know, the bullpens need to start running out. Your guy, even if it's just the manager, you have to run out because who knows what can happen once he takes that wrong step. And let me tell you, you know, he's from, he was in Cincinnati where that's where Amir Garrett was too, who's another guy who charged an entire team at one point a couple of years back. So I guess maybe that, you know, when you're part of Cincinnati, you're ready to throw down. No matter yes. who's behind your yes. back, <laughs> right. but dude is crazy for for going at it like that, man. Yeah, yeah, and it all got started because the pitch that sailed over Mike Trout's head. Yeah, right? um, and then look, and then Anaheim, you know, starts a rookie, right? A late scratch of the their plan starter put a rookie in there just so he can throw at guys, right? And then once he gets kicked out of the game, they put their originally planned starter in the game, right? Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. just that, that's the unwritten rules of baseball. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't gonna bur- we ain't burning our real guy. We're gonna get this rookie up in here. <laughs> <laughs> to throw at you guys, and then once he's tossed, we go. Now the game's gonna start. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's kind of stuff, jacked man. up right there. Yeah, but that was a real fight yesterday, man. But um, look, we we we're, we're close to the All Star break. Um, and you know it's 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 gonna start getting obviously serious real soon. You know what I mean? Where okay, you know, there's no more hours oh, early and this and that and the other. You know, it's going to be time to really, you know, be putting the, the pedal to the metal as we get closer to September. But, um, you know, it's been it's been pretty decent so far um, in, in in Major League Baseball. So um, let, let's let's um, flip real quick to NBA. Um, obviously, we missed, you know, a congratulations to Golden State. Right. They won and. Boston had a great season, um, and you're up in in Massachusetts. So, like, what were people really disappointed in the Celtics, or were they happy that the Celtics were at least able to get there? Because obviously, the Celtics are a young team, but also too on the other side of it, Boston was the best team over the second half of the season. So, I think there was a legitimate expectation that they could take it this year. So. Was it, you know, profound disappointment that they didn't do it? Or was it one of those, hey, man, at least you got there, you got over the hump, and, you you know, you got through the Eastern Conference Finals, and, you know, you, you made it to the NBA Finals? Which one was it? I think it was a little bit of both, but mostly a sense of pride, I think, 
around here. And obviously, I'm not a Celtics fan. I'm a Knicks fan. We all know that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I actually saw, I actually went out with family to a restaurant where they were giving the game and all this stuff. And, you know, once that Celtics game started, the, I think it was game three, if I'm not mistaken, that Boston won. Um, once that game started, everyone quieted down, TVs were turned up, and it felt like you were at TD Garden. The way the the, the people were cheering, the way everyone was hyped, it was a lot of emotion. And, um, you know, I give credit to New England fans, real New England fans, that's how it feels. You know, they, they, mm. they get really into their sports, and I love seeing it. Um, but I think there was a sense of pride. I think going into it, they, the Celtics absolutely had a legitimate shot to win. Like you said, they were the one of the best teams late in the season. They went on that hot run right before the All-Star break after making their adjustments and stuff like that. And they just kind of carried that into the playoffs and beat some really tough opponents. Um, but, you know, I think, like I said, it, they had there was a sense of pride in Boston for that team. And I think that should continue on to next year because this is a team that's not going anywhere. No, they have a great young core, you know, and led by Tatum, you know, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. But, you know, they got to, you know, Marcus Smart isn't that old either. I mean, he's, you know, given the way he plays, he's probably older in his body than in his age. Yeah. Because he's, you know, he just takes such a pounding. But, you know, you got Grant Williams, you got uh, Williams the, the third, you know, who's the, Robert Williams the third, um, you know. And I think they actually have some guys who are ultimately are going to come off the bench and maybe make some contributions, whether that guy Nesbitt, you know what I mean, or others. Yeah. But, you know, they do have, you know, they do have a nice core. They need a point guard. You know, we were talking about that. They need a point guard. And look, NBA free agency is 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 coming up this week, and so – you know, we'll see what what happens what what happens there. Um, you mentioned being a Knicks fan. I'm a Knicks fan too. Um, so I'm happy right now, um, primarily because of what's going on with a team that's not my team, and that's the Brooklyn Nets, <laughs> because um, the experiment didn't work. You know, they went out and they oh we're getting the big three, and okay, fine, and you guys were going to take over the NBA and take the NBA by storm, and everybody's pronouncing. Brooklyn is going to be a dynasty or whatever. Okay. Um, that hasn't happened. And so that makes me happy. Um, but um, speaking of Brooklyn, okay. Kyrie Irving. What's your take right now on what happens to Kyrie Irving? Just a short answer. Does he stay in Brooklyn or is he gone? Actually, just now, he actually opted in to his contract with Brooklyn. Okay. So this All is right. breaking news. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> That's cool. But that doesn't mean he stays. Yes, exactly. Because it still could be a sign and trade going on, right? Um, so that's interesting. So, wow, just as, as <laughs> talking about perfect timing, right? I know. <laughs> right? So he just opted in. But I mean, part of it is if I'm Kyrie Irving, I can't opt out of $37 million. <laughs> Yeah, not at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unless you know you have, you know, a two hundred and fifty million dollar contract or whatever his max is on the free agent market, he would have to know that that that, that money is there before he opted out of, you know, thirty five, thirty six, thirty seven million dollars. So for him to opt in, that doesn't mean he still could be working on or, you know, because the, the the Nets had given him permission to start contacting teams to see if they yeah. could if they would be interested in. So, who knows? Maybe this is just the first step of him getting out of Brooklyn. It could be, and like you said, I think he opted in as this is my my cushion, this is my my safe bl- my safety blanket because <laughs> walking yeah. away from thirty seven million, it's not easy. And I don't think there are a lot of teams out there that are going to be willing, maybe they'll give them, you know, 30 plus for a year, but I don't think there are many teams out there who are willing to go maybe even more than two years on Kyrie Irving right now. So I think just having that for sure, 37 million at the very least, this is worst case scenario or best case scenario, depending on how you want to look at it. He has his 37 million this year guaranteed. So now it's just a matter of, all right, is it going to be with Brooklyn or, 
is there something working out in the background that has yet to be reported? Right. And look, you know, I read something earlier today that during his time with the Nets, there were 226 games on the schedule and he played in 103 of them. Wow. Either because of injuries, personal absences, or last year when he missed a lot of time because he wasn't vaccinated and, you know, the New York um, COVID rules kept him from playing. Um, but, you know, I think as much as he says, and he says it all the time, I don't want to be a distraction. I don't want to be a distraction. Um, I just think that there just seems to always be something going on, you know, surrounding him. Some of it, you know, the media stirs it up, but some of it is of his, you know, he is of his making. And, you know, I just don't know if teams are going to want someone who may not be available, right? Yeah. For whatever reason, personal reasons, you know, political reasons. Because I remember one time he was like, oh, I'm more than a basketball player. I care what's going on around the world. And, you know, and he needed some time to process some world event, you know, that was going yeah. on. It's like, you know, you either got to be in or out. And I think teams have a legitimate concern as to where he is on that you know what i mean and are you going to give a guy a five-year deal because then he has five years guaranteed yeah. money <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. right? and I, I if i'm a if i'm a team I, look i i like Kyrie, it, you know his talent and everything else i just couldn't see committing five years to Kyrie Irving. Yeah, and that's I think that's part of the, the opt in process, the thought process behind the opt in is, you know, let's let's secure what we have in front of us because I don't think someone's gonna commit, you know, like I said, I don't think anyone will commit past two years. And maybe that's a one year guarantee with an option. And and that com- com- completes the two years, but it's hard. You know, the he's the top talent in the league. He's you know, maybe top five in the league, maybe top 10 currently right now. He's one of the best finishers under the basket, Mm -hmm. but the best ability is availability. And, you know, right now the track record does not back up his play. No, not at all. Not at all. So, you know, you just don't, you know, you just, um, you know, it's just hard. It's hard to make that, that kind of a commitment, I think. Um, so we'll see what happens with him. As far as the Knicks are concerned, they seem to be all in on Jalen Brunson, you know, the point guard from the Dallas Mavericks who had a really good postseason and has been, you know, a, a good player, solid player, and probably, you know, had a career year this year. But all of a sudden, the Knicks are like all in on Jalen Brunson as if he's the answer to their situation. He would certainly be an upgrade, but, you know, the bar is low there. Um, I don't I just don't know, man. And like, I mean, the Knicks get to me, the Knicks getting Jalen Brunson is sort of like the Knicks getting Julius Randle a couple of years ago. You know what I mean? Like, OK, yeah. everybody else is out there getting this guy, that guy, the other guy. And we got Julius Randle. Nice the player, one thing, yeah. But does that really get you going as a Knicks fan and go, "Up, oh, that's it. We got Jalen Brunson. Look out!" <laughs> the one thing I hope, man, is that Jalen Brunson doesn't become the next Jerome James, because oh, I, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. he, he won't had, become Jerome James. He was okay in the playoffs, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah. they just want to give him all this money. Yeah, and I don't know even, I don't... James, but oh. I hear you though. You know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah, I, I look, I, I just don't know. Um, the Knicks didn't do anything on draft night except, you know, puzzle people. But I think the Knicks just thought they weren't going to get a player in the draft, drafting at eleven that was going to, you know, come in and be able to, you know, make a real difference. Right. Yeah. Um <clears throat> So I don't I don't blame them for not doing anything in the draft. They had the eleventh pick, so what are they going to do with that? Um, but um, 
But I, you know, I, I'm just so tired of seeing all these other teams like getting these stud players. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. Whether it's the draft, free agency, it's like the Knicks always get the tier B and C players. Yeah, we just we can never just sit <laughs> for once. Right. I mean, because even when they got RJ man. Barrett at three. Zion went first. John Morant went second. It's like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. RJ Bell is a nice player, but he's not John Morant. No. You know? Man. And even and when they signed Amari Stoudemire. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's yeah, like... we just can't seem to get the guys, man. You know man. I mean? We get Tracy McGrady when he doesn't have anything left in his knee. You know what I mean? Like, Steve um, Francis. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so I don't know, man. I, I it'll be interesting to see what the Knicks do in free agency. Um, they really haven't seemed to be the destination spot for a real stud player, and I think that's what they're going to need. They're going to need someone that says, you know, I, I want to, you know, I'm going to the garden. What about this, man? Would you? Would you want Kyrie Irving on the Knicks? Oh, I'll tell you. Talent-wise, yes. Do I want to deal with the uncertainty? I'll tell you, Jeff. I think I'll take him. Really? <laughs> yeah. I think look, I'd I think take you. Him. Yeah, I mean, I think I would too. <laughs> Because I think, first of all, as you said, you know, from a talent perspective, he, is there's no denying his ability. Yeah. And he is better than anyone the Knicks have. I think the question, though, after you f- kind of say that initially, is does he really make the Knicks better? D- yeah. What does he do? Does he make R.J. Barrett better? Does he make Julius Randle better? Does he, you know what I mean? Does he, does he make the team better, right? I, and here's the thing. I really don't know what the answer is. I don't, I don't think, I'm not saying the answer is no. I just don't know what the answer is, right? Because I don't know if he's shown himself to be a guy who's going to consistently, because he, has, he doesn't play consistently, you know, just kind of like blend in with a team and especially a young team like the Knicks and make them better. And I think if you have a young nucleus anywhere, that's why I think LA is talking about getting him. Because yeah. they got a bunch of veterans and old, old older guys out there, but with a young team, does he is he going to help in the development of R.J. Barrett? He um, didn't help the Celtics. That's the big concern. No, when, he you didn't. know those guys were all young. Yep. Well, younger, I should say, because they're yeah. still young. Yeah, but he didn't. That's right. He didn't help them. You know, is he going to you know help Obi Toppin become better? You know what I mean. Yeah. You know, what does he do to a guy like Emmanuel quickly? Does he, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And I know Kyrie would, you know, give you the company line and say, yeah, I'm all in and I want to help, you know, these guys get better. But has he, that's not his track record. So that would concern me. But I think the talent is too enticing to say no if you're a Knicks yeah. fan. And then you can stick it to Brooklyn too, right? <laughs> Imagine the Knicks winning a championship with Kyrie. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, it'd be yeah, it'd be weird, but we'll set the um, parade in Brooklyn for that one. Yeah, but we'll see what happens. You know, we'll see what happens. Uh, obviously, free agency is 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 going to start in a couple of days. You know, um, at the end of this week. Um, real quickly, man, uh, on the last the last note, um, you know, we were talking, you know, months ago when we were, you know, um, meeting more regularly um, about Brittany Griner and, you know, bring her home, bring her home. And, you know, there had been there was an extension of her detention. And then, you know, now there's been another one, you know, there's been a six month extension and her trial begins on Friday, July 1st. So obviously there's a lot going on behind the scenes, you know, in terms diplomatically and so forth. But, you know, there's a trial coming up starting on Friday. And, you know, her detention has already been extended by 
another six months. Um, and as they, you know, they talk about like what 99% of those who are prosecuted in, in, in Russia or, you know, are found guilty or whatever. Right. So, yeah. um, I don't know, man, you know, um, it, it's been out there for a long time and there's been a lot of support expressed, um, across the sports spectrum, but still a bad story. And it's like with, you know, the, the war with Russia and Ukraine continue to go on, going on, that's not helping any diplomatically. So who knows what's going to happen with Brittany Griner, but obviously everyone's still keeping their eyes closely on it and trying to, and the government's trying all it can to get her home. Yeah. And it's just, it continues to be a scary situation. You know, you, you wonder why the constant extensions and this, and, and it, it just seems like every time things may look like they're somewhat clearing up, something else gets in the way. And it, it's just, it, it's unfortunate. It's, frustrating um and you just hope for the best man you just really yeah do. yeah and i know russia has floated the idea of getting one of it's um you know a russian who's in in an american prison but this guy's you know in there yeah. for like arms dealing and you know what i mean and you know okay. yeah and like okay you want him in exchange for britney griner it's like okay that right she has some cbd oil according to you so right a guy it's who's kinda, like yeah and it shows the um the intent behind all yes. these extensions and this and it's just yeah oh yeah oh yeah it's nothing right when we we were talking about that from the beginning right yeah that this is that this has all the makings of you know uh, you know some fabrication that that is designed you know to to get a, a swap of some kind yeah you know um but you know but this is not a movie you know what i mean this is not this is real and yeah. you know you just feel for britney griner and what she's been through um and then you know obviously with the trial coming up and it seems like a long road road ahead but you know if there's going to be a solution here it's going to be because diplomatically something gets done right and some deal is going to be cut it's just you know what it's going to look like and more importantly when is it going to happen and we all hope it happens sooner than later so that she can finally be be back home so um we'll we'll keep you know we started you know early on when we first heard of the story and we'll just keep you know keep our eye on it and keep shining a light on it until um until she's back yeah and that's the hope, man. Hopefully, like you said, hopefully it happens sooner rather than later. Yep, that's right. All right, brother. Well, man, so good to to get back at it. And, um, you know, 4th of July is next week. You know, uh, I guess it's on Monday. And we're recording now on Monday night. So I don't know if we record next week, but or next Monday, probably next Tuesday, we, we can get back at it. But um, But we're back, man and we we're going to keep we're going to keep it going so good catching up with you brother um and just look forward to to you know covering more and more uh story that's coming along and listen on that score as we get get ready to get on out of here have you been paying attention to what's going on in golf do you pay attention to that at all with that new golf league over in, in saudi arabia i Live? have not actually i haven't Man. been following that that's some crazy stuff right there. And we're going to have to talk about that. And maybe we can get someone who's, you know, I know a couple of, uh, you know, folk who are really deep into golf to talk about that, because I think that new golf league where you have a lot of PGA players who are defecting and going mm. over there to play and they're playing for the money, you know, and, oh, wow. um, you know, the PGA is suspending guys and saying, you know, you can't play for both leagues and all the rest of that or both tours. Um, it's uh, it's really, really interesting. And so that's something we got to keep an eye on. And But we'll, wow. we'll take a look at that and other stories, man. But, man, just good to be back. And we'll come back next week. And let's do it all again. That's right, man. Subway Series this year. 
That's right. Let's do it. That's right. Let's go, Mets. <laughs> All right, brother. I'll talk to you next time. Take care. All right.